Good morning, church. Today's reading is from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from his presence or from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. That was good, huh? You guys could hear that okay, couldn't you? You might need to have your hearing checked. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. Good to have you with us. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 3. I want to welcome those of you that are on YouTube Live. Sorry about that. I don't know if it came through on YouTube Live or not, but uh, probably didn't. We'll just say it didn't because it didn't happen here. So you guys have seen it enough, you know. We'll show it maybe two more times as we wrap up this series in the next couple of weeks. But you guys happy to be here? Excellent. Wow, you are. I am too. I'm very excited you're here today. Got a great message. Uh, greatest story ever told, a biblical worldview. We're talking about the fall, a problem. And here's the thesis statement for this whole teaching series. The Bible is the greatest story ever told. The Bible is the greatest story ever told. It is a love story of creation, man's fall, God's glorious redemption and restoration. And at the center of this story, there is a baby upon whom everything would depend. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. And we love it around here. I love this time of the year. And so that's, that's the thesis statement. So the Bible isn't just a bunch of stories about what you must do to be right with God. That's called moralism, it's called religion. <laughs> and a lot of people think that's what the Bible's all about, but it's actually a single story. There's a single storyline. All the stories feed that single storyline of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, about what God has done to make us right with him. Uh, and so we've come now, we talked about creation. In fact, if you haven't heard the first two, go online and listen to the foundation of this whole idea of a biblical worldview. My son, Russ, did a good job at laying the foundation. Listen to that and then, and then look at the, the next one, which was creation last weekend. That was packed full. And now this weekend we're talking about the fall. Let me start off by giving you a quote from the movie Silence of the Lambs. Welcome to Desert Breeze. <laughs> a young FBI trainee, Officer Starling, is given the task of interviewing Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychiatrist and grisly killer kept under close watch in the Baltimore State Hospital for the criminally insane. Officer Starling is hoping to get some insight into the minds 
of murderers to help them track down another serial killer. Officer Starling says to Hannibal Lecter, I think you can provide some insight and advance the study. And what possible reason could I have to do that? Curiosity? About what? About why you're here and what happened to you. Nothing happened to me, Officer Starling. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. You've given up good and evil for behaviorism, Officer Starling. You've got everybody in moral dignity pants. Nothing is ever anybody's fault. Look at me, Officer Starling. Can you stand to say I'm evil? Am I evil, Officer Starling? End of quote. Now, you can't help but hear Anthony Hopkins and his voice in that last part there. It's pretty creepy, actually. You just go, oh. But, but here's the idea here, is our tendency is to want to know when people are evil or struggle with sin, is like, what happened to them? And, and the Bible, and I'm not minimizing what has happened to any of us. I'm not minimizing that at all. There's, there can be some really bad things that can happen to us. And those things can certainly influence us, but listen to me, they don't control us. You're not defined by what's happened to you. And in fact, the Bible makes it pretty clear that evil is not out there somewhere, but it goes right down the middle of every human heart on this planet. In fact, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We are sinners by nature and by choice. And so take a look at your sermon notes here, part of the intro, and it's imp important for us to understand when we look at this idea of the fall, the problem. We live in a very broken world filled with sin and suffering. All of us would agree with that. So, so we looked at creation. We are created as objects of God's love to have a relationship with God. Wow, in the Garden of Eden, but something went wrong, and it continues to go wrong. So what went wrong? We, we live in a broken world filled with sin and suffering. Now, if we'll be honest, all of us have sinned. Would you guys agree with that? Everybody on the planet has sinned. We've all committed sins. Motive, thought, word, deed, we've all done it. And we all continue to do that. Unless, we, unless God gets a hold of our life and we begin to do it less and less, hopefully. So we've all sinned and we've all been sinned against. Would you agree with that? So we've all sinned, we've all been sinned against, and unless we take personal responsibility and learn how to deal biblically with both, so how do you deal biblically with both? It's found in the Lord's Prayer, that section where it says, and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. That's, that's the key right there. Unless we learn how to do that, we will inevitably be part of the problem rather than the solution in our broken world. So we will not, our tendency in our world, and this is what's happening, is that we become like the evil that is being done to us rather than to overcome evil with good by receiving his forgiveness, forgiveness for our sins and then offering that forgiveness for those that have sinned against us. That's what ultimately brings the healing to our life. Now, Genesis chapter 3 is one of the most important in all the Bible because it explains the cause of our sin and suffering. Why is this place so messed up? It gives us right here, Genesis chapter 3, gives us a cause. But then it also gives us, shows us how we unsuccessfully try to cope with it. So there are certain things that we do with our sin and suffering that keeps us stuck in our sin and suffering. So we, how we try to cope with it, and then it gives us the curse we're currently living under. You know, what are the, what's the ripple effect? What are the consequences? And then, uh, man, at the end of this, we'll talk about, and it's, it's in this chapter, God's amazing cure. So God has given us an amazing cure. So that's where we're headed with it. But before we dive into this text, keep your Bibles handy. We'll be looking back to Genesis chapter 3, so keep them handy. I'll refer to verses there, and then we, you can fill in the blanks as we work through these notes. But let's first pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just take a moment. This is what I'd like for us to pray. Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Just between you and God, 
This is what I would ask you to do. Just search me, O God, and know my heart. Just say that to him. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We ask these things in Jesus' beautiful name and everyone said, amen. So let's talk about cause. Now, this is what you need to know. Sin is deeper than our behavior. You guys agree with that? We tend to get preoccupied with our behavioral, you know, our behavior. And so oftentimes people think that Christianity is about behavioral modification. No, it's not. It's about heart transformation. God goes much deeper down into our heart. Our behavior is the fruit. Our beliefs is the root. We've got to understand what's going on in our heart. And so this is what goes down. This is the cause of our sin and suffering on the planet. It starts with unbelief then it leads to pride and then to idolatry. Those three words, they're all, they all build on each other. They're all interrelated. So it starts with unbelief. That's your first fill in the blank on your notes. Unbelief is doubting God's goodness. We see that in verses one through five. Now remember how, what the serpent said. I, I, I always laugh when I hear that first part of that, that text where it says that the serpent was more crafty than all the other animals. And I always go right to the fact that my wife's very crafty. And uh, it doesn't mean it quite like that, okay? Okay, maybe it's just a joke that I, I, I find interesting. But, but crafty meaning he's deceptive. He's terribly deceptive. My wife's not deceptive, but she is crafty. And... Uh, and so he's deceptive and he deceives us. Uh, notice in verse 1, he says to the woman, did God really say? Did he really say that? And then in verses 4 through 5, you will not surely die. Now what's interesting about how he comes after her is the serpent is sneering He's mocking. He's trying to create an atmosphere of intimidation with dogmatic assertions rather than defensible arguments. You guys know the difference between defensible arguments versus dogmatic assertions? So he's bringing dogmatic assertions. Did God really say that? You're not going to die if you eat of that tree. That sneer, intimidation. That's dumb. Why would you believe that? You guys kind of get it? You understand what, what's happening here? Really fascinating here when you begin to study that. And now this is what's heartbreaking. And I know that this, this, this statistic, I can't even say statistic, but this statistic <laughs> is, is very true. 80% of our evangelical kids lose their faith in college. Did you know that? That's heartbreaking. That's horrible. Our, our colleges are, you know, uh, are very liberal for the most part. Unless you go to a good, solid Christian college, and, and even Christian colleges have become very liberal. 80% of our evangelical kids, evangelical kids lose their faith in college. And they do that through a sneering, mocking atmosphere of intimidation, of dogmatic assertions rather than dis defensible arguments. I find it interesting when someone doesn't have a good defensible argument, it's a dogmatic assertion and it's a form of intimidation and bullying. That's what the enemy's doing. They try to bully you, try to intimidate you. That's, that's stupid. What are you, an idiot? You believe what? You're not going to die. You can eat from that. And so he's creating this unbelief, doubting God's goodness. Now let me... Let me teach you something here before we move on. When somebody says to you, and I've had people say this to me, do you really believe that? That's ridiculous. This is how you want to respond. A good response would be, well, that's a dogmatic assertion trying to create an atmosphere of intimidation. It's not really a defensible argument. So could you please tell me why you think what I believe is invalid or unsound? Okay, write that down. <laughs> Note that, remember that. 
And know the difference between a dogmatic assertion, defensible argument, and then an attitude of intimidation. Because it's going to come in your way if you haven't already experienced it. I, I've experienced it when I worked construction, when I was on the fire department. You believe what? That's ridiculous. That's the dumbest thing in the world. And, and so you want to be able to respond to that and not get in their face and do what they did. You overcome evil with good. You try to get them to think deeper about that. So what is the serpent doing here? He's not attacking their belief in God's existence, but in God's goodness. It is character assassination. That is the lie of the serpent that has passed into every human heart. You can't trust God. He's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. You're going to be happier by pursuing the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures that are found in God. Oh, the pleasures in this world are so much better than the pleasures of God. Oh, if you're going through suffering, oh, God's holding out on you. See, he doesn't really have your best interest at heart when you go through suffering. So he, he deceives us with the pleasures of this world. He disillusions us with the suffering in this world. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. If you obey him, he'll keep you down. If you give your life to him, you'll miss out. If you serve God, he won't be all that you want to be. You're not going to be able to really achieve much if you serve him. So, starts with unbelief, doubting God's goodness. That's the root of all sin. Anytime you take a path that's outside of God's will, you're believing that. You're thinking you're going to actually be happier by pursuing that than pursuing God. That's insane. You're being duped. You're being bullied. What are you thinking? You're not. And she takes the bait. And he does too, as we will see. It moves from unbelief to pride. That's your next fill in the blank. This is substituting yourself for God. So look at verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. <laughs> that sounds good. Wow, that sounds very appealing. So here's what we do. So we, so we start doubting God's goodness. He's holding out on us. So we turn from God, the source of ultimate honor and glory. And immediately when we turn from him, what happens? We become empty of that honor and glory. We take life into our own hands. I can figure this out on my own. That's what pride is. It's self-centeredness. It's substituting yourself for God. So we're empty of the glory and honor that only he can give. We become self-centered. It's pride. And then from that point on, with this self-centeredness, everything becomes a means to an end so that we can fill our hearts with the glory and the honor that we should have been getting from God, pride or sin is always focusing on yourself, always choosing yourself over God and others, always placing yourself at the center. And yes, of course, you do bad things out of self-centeredness. I mean, people who do bad things out of self-centeredness are easy to recognize because they are, they're hard to get along with. They're a pain to be around when they're, it's all about them. They're impatient, they're unkind, they're envious, they're boastful, they're proud, they're domineering, they're controlling, they're abusive, they're easily angered, fault-finding, hypersensitive, bitter, scornful, dishonest, the list goes on. But you can also do good things out of self-centeredness. You can not only do bad things out of self-centeredness, but you can also do good things out of self-centeredness. This is what I find really crazy. I oftentimes hear preachers and often Christians trying to help people to not do bad things and start doing good things, and all they're doing is harnessing their self-centeredness to do the good things. They're still stuck in sin. That's pride. But you can also do good things out of self-centeredness. You can pursue friendships and help the poor and study your Bible and attend church and obey the Ten Commandments not for God's glory and others' good, but for your glory and good, for me, all about me. You can relate to God and other people in such a way and only to the degree that it furthers 
your agenda and makes you feel good about yourself. And as soon as your relationship with God and others becomes too costly, I'm gone. It's over. Because you had a consumer relationship. It was all about you. Your heart was empty. You're trying to fill it up with what they're going to do for you. That's crazy. That's no way to live. You have unbelief. You have pride. You're self-centered. It just makes sense that that's the direction you're headed. So why, why would you do that? Why, why can you do good things out of self-centeredness? What does that look like? Well, because even when it looks like you're serving God and other people, you're actually serving yourself. That's how insidious sin is. So how do you know you're serving God and others out of self-centeredness or out of pride? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Did you ask that? Okay, maybe you didn't. Okay, I'm asking that. Okay, I'm asking that. Yeah, that, so what, I start thinking about that. It's like, well, what does that look like? Man, I don't want to go there. And I think the best example of that is the, uh, it's the prodigal son's story. I think both of them are prodigal in the 15th chapter of Luke. Remember the younger brother that took the inheritance and ran off and did the wild, crazy living? That's self-centeredness, certainly. Doing really bad stuff out of self-centeredness. But the elder brother does good stuff out of self-centeredness. And how did we know that? Well, here's, here's what it looks like. You will be very self-righteous. Sound like the elder brother in the story of the prodigal sons? Yep, 15th chapter of Luke. You'll be very self-righteous. You have an attitude of superiority. You claim to be above reproach, sinless. I'm not like all those other sinners out there. Very puffed up about your knowledge about God. Man, you know the Bible. Sounds like the Pharisees, doesn't it? Isn't that how the Pharisees were? Pharisees are a perfect example of this. You're very unforgiving, very judgmental spirit. You have this joyless, fear-motivated compliance to rules. You don't serve God and others because your heart's so filled up with God. No, you're in a deficit mode. You're trying to fill the emptiness up. So therefore, you've got this joyless, fear-motivated compliance to rules. You can be very angry and bitter. By the way, Pharisees tend to raise atheists or little Pharisees. And so you don't want to do good out of selfishness or self-centeredness. You do it because you're wanting to glorify God because your heart's so filled up with who he is. And so you go unbelief, doubting God's goodness, pride, substituting yourself for God to idolatry, loving anything more than God. So it makes sense. It makes sense. So, so when you kind of unpack sin, try to understand sin, what's going on in our heart, it always starts with this doubting God's goodness. He's holding out on me. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. So it goes unbelief, pride, taking matters into my own hands. I'm going to be very self-centered. Oh, and immediately it goes right into idolatry. Tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Notice it doesn't give you a third option there. You're either going to serve the one true and living God or you're going to have a counterfeit God. You're going to have a pseudo-savior. Everybody gives their life to something or someone. Everyone has a Lord of their life, whether they want to call it that or not. Everyone's serving someone or something. And that's idolatry, loving anything more than God. And so Eve has exchanged the truth of God for a lie and is worshiping and serving this created thing, this tree, more than the creator. And so what we need to understand is that we are what we love. We worship what we love. And we might not actually love what we say we love. So it's not a question of whether we worship, but what we worship. Everybody's a worshiper. Everybody on the planet. The world's not divided up into worshipers and non-worshipers. No, the, the world is divided up into those that worship God and those that worship a counterfeit God. And so worship, when we talk about worshiping God, worship is ascribing ultimate worth and value to, to God in such a way that it engages and energizes your whole being, your mind, emotion, 
and will. But when we turn from the true and living God and begin to worship created things over the Creator, isn't that what she's doing in verse 6? If you've got your Bibles open, look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, whoo, it's captured her mind. It's got her undivided attention. And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, what does that have? It's beginning to stir her deepest emotions. It's got a hold of her affections. She took of its fruit and ate. Uh Uh-oh, will and actions. Mind, emotion, actions. Attention, affections, actions, the will. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he Eight. Now, let me ask you this. How do you identify your idols? Y'all have idols. You know that. Our heart is an idol factory. And this is where the battle is. So when we start doubting God's goodness, we turn away from the living God, we become very self-centered. And in that self-centeredness, we begin to look to things that we give our deepest loyalties and affections to more so than God. It's just natural for us to do that. We're trying to fill the emptiness inside of us up with something or someone when we turn away from Him. That's the battle. That's the struggle. How do you know you got an idol? How do you identify your idols? You should know by now because you hang out with me long enough here. We talk about it a lot here. Would you guys agree with that? You guys hear me talk a lot about idols? Okay, probably not enough. Just two or three of you said yep, okay? I need to keep pounding this. I mean, if you can't identify your idols and those things that grab a hold of your attention, affection, and actions, you're out of touch with how the enemy is, is going to dupe you and deceive you and, and take you away. And so she's, she's unaware of that. So how do you do that? Well, you follow the trail of your attention, affection, and actions. What dominates your thoughts? What stirs your deepest emotions? What moves you to action? What motivates your actions? Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from that. Guard your heart. Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, so the, the things that we treasure, things we love and worship. Where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. Your heart, mind, emotion, will. So here's a couple of statements that helped me years ago. They're very convicting statements for me. And uh, I didn't get it initially. And then when I really begin to do some more mindfulness and kind of uh, emotional intelligence, kind of looking into my heart and saying, hey, what is it that captured my heart more than God? Uh, These statements help me. So here's what you need to always keep in mind. The true God of your heart is what your thoughts effortlessly go to when nothing else is demanding your attention. So where does your mind go in your solitude? Here's another one. The things you daydream about in your spare time are ultimately the things you love, worship, and serve. So when I begin to slow down enough to really think about what I was thinking about, I realized that I'm a workaholic. I was thinking about getting things done, my to-do list, all the things I still needed to do. And I also found I was doing a lot of brain debates over conversations I had had in the past. Like, they said that to me. I can't believe that they said that. I should have said this back to them. And I, 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 I have a tendency to be a people pleaser. I let what people say about me get a hold of my life more so than what God has said about me. I'm working to try to fill up an emptiness inside rather than out of the fullness that he's already given me because that's what dominated my thoughts, stirred my deepest emotions, and motivated my actions. I mean, here of late as I was thinking about it, man, I I have some anxiety about my kids and my grandkids. And it's just showing my failure to really trust God and to cast my burdens upon Him so that He could sustain me and not let me be shaken. Psalm 55, 22, that's biblical, but I'm not living it. I begin to go, ah, ah, what's going on here? Have you ever thought that deep? Do you think about that? That's really important for us to understand. That begins to identify your idols, your misplaced sense of security and significance and satisfaction. So so how do you change your behavior? 
you've got to change what you love and worship. And here's what I've learned through the years. This is what's been really helpful for me. The power of sin's promise is always broken by the power of God's promise. So, so what, what needs to happen here with Adam and Eve is that they need to realize that there's greater pleasure in finding God than there is in sin. The power of sin's promise. Sin offers a promise. We don't sin because we, we have to. We sin because we want to because it offers a, a promise of pleasure. <gasps> Ooh, God's holding out on you. Look at over here. Ooh, you're going to be so much happier. That's what they're buying into. They're taking the bait. So that's the kind of thinking that's going on. The power of sin's promise, it has power over us. It only has power over us as long as I believe it, that I can actually be happier by pursuing something created more than the creator. But the power of sin's promise is always broken by the power of God's promise, by the by the power of God's promise, the inferior pleasures of sin are overcome by the superior pleasures of our Savior. See, that's what Adam and Eve should have done at that moment. Wait a minute, that's a lie. He's not holding out on us. And by the way, that's a sneer too, you little snarky snake. And, and so get off our back. Get out of here. We're not going that way. So what do you do? You confront those lies with the truth of God's word. You got to get good at it. You got to know how to wield the sword. They should have cut the head off the snake right there with the word of God. No, God already promised us. Oh, by the way, you're trying to make God look like he's a restrictor rather than a liberator. He only said this one tree. He's given us the whole garden. He's given us everything. He just said just this one tree. Everything else you can eat from. God's not a restrictor. He's a liberator. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not buying what you're selling. I'm staying with God. That's what they should have done. And, and you're not going to do that if you haven't tasted of the goodness of God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I tasted years ago, and I keep tasting every day. I'm telling you, what he offers is so much better than anything in this world. And if, if you need to be reminded of that, just hang out with me because I'll keep telling you. I'll say, come on. Come on now, keep coming to him and enjoying him and experiencing him. Who Christ is and what he's done for you must become more beautiful to your imagination and more attractive to your heart than your idol. I call it replacement rejoicing in the face of idols. When, I, when I'm squaring off with an idol and I realize, ah, this is, I'm loving this more than I'm loving God, I replace it by rejoicing in what I have in God that, that is greater than what that idol could ever dare to give to me, whatever that idol might be. Idols can be good things that have become ultimate things, like a marriage relationship or kids or a job or any number of good things. So, so let me ask you this question. So we kind of wrapped up here and we're going to transition. And I wanted you to understand that. So think, think about this. The cause of our sin and suffering is that what does it start with? What's the first thing? Unbelief, so we doubt God's goodness. What does that lead to? Pride. Pride. I'm going to take life into my own hands. I'm going to substitute myself for God. And then that leads to what? Idolatry. I begin to love anything and everything more than I love God. That's idolatry. Trying to get from those idols what I should be getting from, from God. So let me ask you this question. Where was Adam all of this time? While well, she's being tempted. Well, actually, in verse 6, it says, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. He was right there. He was right there. Now, let me ask you this. Who did God originally give the command to? Adam? Okay. Only Adam. Genesis 2, 15 through 17, before Eve was created. Now, presumably, the woman was to get her information from the man about what God said. Would you guys agree with that? Okay. Here's my question just for women. I, I, just, I just want the women to answer this, okay? You can answer it out loud. Have you ever known a man to have any kind of communication difficulties? <laughs> hey, I'm not finished with the question. I didn't even finish the question. You're already on that. Okay, let me say it again. Have you ever known a man to have any kind of communication difficulties to not always give detailed accounts of his conversations? Oh, 
Some of you said, yes. Other, you, others just kind of like, yes. You know that's how they are. Okay. And so, you know, I, I just, I find that, uh, I find that interesting, you know, the conversation I'm thinking might have gone something like this. Oh, yeah, about that tree in the middle of the garden. I forgot to tell you about that, honey. <laughs> or maybe I didn't go into enough detail about that. But he's just standing right there. Now, okay, now this is just a question for the men, okay? Men, I think you can do better than what the women did right here, okay? I want to hear a big amen if you agree with this statement. Come on, you can do it. Here's my question just for men. Have you ever known a woman to have any kind of communication difficulties to not always listen to the detailed accounts of your conversation? Oh, that's weak. Back me up on this. I don't know how many times I've told my wife, I gave you all the details. No, you didn't give me any details at all. Here's, the, here's, I think, what we can learn from this. When we are playing with temptation in isolation and don't tell anyone what we're being tempted by, we make ourselves all the more vulnerable. Eve should have involved Adam in the process. She should have said, hey, let me step back here from the servant just for a minute. Honey, take care of my light work here, okay? Take his head off. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Or he should have said, honey... Or, or what she should have done is what Nancy does when we're out walking and a, a dog comes up barking at us. She pushes me out in the front. <laughs> I go, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't blame her. I told her, you can push me out there all day long if you want to. I will take on that dog for you, my sweet girl. And I was like, bring it on, dude. I will kick you in the next week, dude. <laughs> That's how I feel when dogs come out after. It's like, oh, I take you. Where's a rock? <laughs> you better keep your dog locked up, okay? If I'm walking in your neighborhood. <laughs> okay, I got off. I got off there. Just a little bit. But that's what should have happened. I mean, he should have stepped in there and taken on the lies of the serpent. He should have crushed the head of that serpent right then. That's why we teach in our men's men's fraternity, our men's group, one of our leaders back there. You know this, man. You know this like the back of your hand. You teach our guys this. Reject passivity. This guy is passive. Reject passivity. Take responsibility. Lead courageously. Seek the reward of God. Now, when God comes into the garden after they've sinned, so it seems as though Eve is kind of leading the way in the sin. The man should have stepped up. But when God comes back in the garden, who does he address first and foremost? Yeah. Why? Because he's responsible. But the Lord called to the man, verse 9. Okay, so cause, unbelief, doubting God's goodness, pride, substituting yourself for God, idolatry, loving anything more than we love God. But this is how we try to cope with the sins we've committed and sins that have been committed against us unsuccessfully and therefore keeping ourselves trapped in our brokenness. We hide and we hurl. That's weird, Pastor Ray. Why would you say hurl? Because it's kind of like throwing up on someone. Hurl. <laughs> that sounds weird, doesn't it? It's just blame shifting is what it is. And I like to alliterate words and so there you go. You've got two H's. And it's easy to remember. Hiding and hurling. Am I hiding or hurling? I'm doing both right now. Okay. Just so you know. So hiding is fig leaves and trees. So in Genesis 2.25, they were both naked and unashamed. Did you notice that? In 2.25, we read that text last weekend. They were both naked and unashamed. Naked is a Hebrew idiom meaning fully known and fully loved. And then they go from fully known and fully loved, naked and unashamed, to naked and full of shame because of their sin. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Let's talk a little bit about sin. So sin, unbelief, pride, idolatry, will always lead to guilt and shame. Guilt is troubled over what you've done. Shame is troubled over who you are. Shame cuts to the core of your identity. 
And so guilt and shame should, through the work of the Holy Spirit, draw us to God for confession, repentance, forgiveness, and healing. Because that's what he's offering them in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They were running from God. They should have been running to God for confession, repentance, forgiveness, and healing. And by the way he asked those questions, that's what he's offering them. Now, what are fig leaves, by the way? They, they, they're hiding behind the trees, but they already put fig leaves on. So what are fig leaves? I, I know what fig leaves are, okay. I'm not talking like that. I'm just meaning, how do we put fig leaves on? We all wear fig leaves. We all have fig leaves. Fig leaves are anything you use to make yourself look bigger, stronger, smarter, more together than what you really are. It's pretense. It's mask wearing. It's game playing. I'm afraid that if you really got to know me, if I really started sharing my heart with you, you'd probably reject me. And so guess what? I'm going to make myself look better and bigger. I want to be accepted by you. And so what do we do? We have fig leaves. Fig leaves is, uh, here's some of the fig leaves of our culture today. I am what I do. Look at my performance. <laughs> I'm successful, man. Look at all the things that I've accomplished. You, I am what I do. So that drives me so that I can feel good about myself. I'm trying to fill the emptiness inside with what I do, my performance, rather than from what God says about me, what he's done for me, what I have in him. I am what I do. I am what I have, my possessions. Look at, look at my car, look at my home. <laughs> look at me. I mean, isn't that our culture? It's what I do. It's what I have. So it's, it's performance, it's possessions, or what people say about me. How many likes or dislikes I have on social media. It's popularity. See, this is getting our identity from created things rather than a creator. That'll never fill the emptiness in our heart that only God can fill, no matter how hard you work with all of that. I love how the Bible balances the playing field. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean this, that the Bible puts us all in the same category. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all guilty and have shame, and that should drive us to our Savior. It puts it like this. I, I love 1 John 1, 7 through 9. It talks about relationship with God, intimacy with God. And it says if, if, um, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have relationship with God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, you know, his light will expose our darkness and therefore we'll need cleansing. In fact, it goes on to verse 7, 1 John 1, uh, 7, 8. Actually, verse 8, it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's talking to believers, by the way. He's talking about God as being light and exposes darkness. Therefore, we need the cleansing of his blood for our sins. And oh, by the way, if you think you are without sin, you're self-deceived because everybody struggles with sin. Everybody has hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And so, hey, just deal with it. Don't run from God. Don't hide. Don't put on the fig leaves. Run to him and have him bring cleansing and healing and wholeness that you desperately need. That's what they should have done. That's what we need to do. That's what I love about Desert Breeze. That's what I love about this church. And I can't say that about all churches, but I know this church, and this is what we've always wanted Desert Breeze to be about. The church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. You guys agree with that? Isn't that what the church is to be about? In fact, becoming a Christian is not an admission. It's not an admission that you have it all together. It's actually an admission that you don't have it all together. Because I've had people say to me, well, I thought you were a Christian. Yeah, I am. What does that mean? I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. Well, I thought you would have it all together. Well, that's not an admission that I have it all together just because I claim to be a Christian. It's actually an admission that I don't have it all together and I'm desperately in need of a Savior. Oh, by the way, let me just say that Christianity is not like all the other belief systems in our world today. You see, every other belief system, the good are in, the bad are out. Get your act together, live a certain way, and then you're in. If you don't, you're out. But Christianity is this, the humble 
are in, the proud are out. You just have to recognize you need a Savior, and you're in, and you give your life to Him. They should have been running to Him with their guilt and shame, not from Him, hiding from one another. Man, don't fall prey to that. We are only as sick as our secrets, and there is no healing in hiding. I, I was listening to the song this morning. It's a Christmas song. O come all ye unfaithful. Anybody hear that? Have you heard that song? Oh, wait, Pastor Ray, that's a wrong, that's not unfaithful, it's faith. No, no, I got that one. I'm not talking about that song. Faithful means you put your faith in Christ because you need him. I got that. I'm not trying to tear down an old historic song. No, this is unfaithful. That's us. You need a Savior. We all need a Savior. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Tells us in James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another, and you'll be healed. So let me ask you, do you have a few close friends that you can share your heart with? See, I believe you should be authentic with all, but deep disclosure with a few trusted friends. That's why we do small groups. So you can have a safe environment where you come in and go, man, I didn't do so well this week. Oh, my goodness, my marriage, my finances, my life. Ah, oh, help, please. You got people there to rally around you, to love you, support you, understand you, because they're like right there with you. The Bible balances the playing field. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The more skillful we are at impression management, the more we are trapped in our aloneness and more vulnerable to our adversary. And so, how do we get over that hiding from God and hiding from one another, the fig leaves and the hiding behind trees? Well, I, I think we've got to understand this about God. <laughs> this is what has set me free. No one knows you like God. He knows you to the bottom of your soul. And at the same time, he loves you to the sky. And he forgives all of your sins to the point that he will never, ever, ever hold any of your sin against you. Did you know that? That's, that's Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So he knows every detail about your life and yet loves you to the skies and then forgives you. In fact, I, I didn't put this on your notes. You can put it down. Psalm 103.11. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love, his steadfast love for us. How high are the heavens above the earth? It's incalculable. He's just like, what? You love me that much? Oh, and by the way, the verse right after that, as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Well, it's exactly, you don't know what it is. What is it saying? He, he removes our transgressions from us, from as far as the east is from the west. In other words, they're gone. All your sins, past, present, and future, they're gone. Oh, my goodness, that's why you can be authentic. Because the only eyes in the universe that matter sees you fully, loves you deeply, forgives you completely, and that will set you free from hiding from him and from one another, unlike anything else. And so when we come out of hiding, the next thing we do to mismanage this is we start hurling. We start blame shifting. In verse 11, God asked Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? Adam reflects on the importance of taking personal responsibility for his actions, summons his courage, and responds, the woman made me do it. I love that response. Go, Adam. Yeah, dude, you're on at something right there, man. I'm going to use that. That's biblical, by the way, folks. I've got that underlined. Yeah, that's biblical. See, he told me I'm supposed to blame you for everything. That's what he's doing. No, 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 no. It's not 
prescriptive, it's descriptive. Just describing what the knucklehead did. I mean, and, and what's interesting, I mean, it doesn't, uh, the woman made me do it. And worse than that, he says, the woman you put here with me. In other words, whose idea was it to create the woman in the first place? I was okay with all the animals, and then you came along and said, it's not good for you to be alone, Adam. And then all of a sudden, I've got a naked woman right here. Probably shouldn't have said naked, but that was true. Got a naked woman here. You're the one that brought the woman into the deal here. It wasn't my idea, God. The woman you gave me. Ay, ay, ay. He blames her and God. I mean, Adam has moved a long way from his bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh song. <laughs> Remember the song at the end of chapter 2? Oh, whoa, man. She is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Not anymore. He's sewing her right under the bus. That's crazy. And then verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent made me do it. I am so thankful that they are the very last couple to ever blame each other. <laughs> Nancy and I never do this. Actually, I think she blames me more than I blame her. And I'm going to blame her for that. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. This is what we need to learn. Healing begins where hiding and hurling ends. Remember what we said at the beginning? We all kind of agreed. Group confession time, group healing. Welcome to our therapy. Yeah, we all said, yeah, we've all sinned. We've all been sinned against. So at some point in our life, we've got to take responsibility and say, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I can't hide anymore and I can't do the hurling anymore. Healing begins where hiding and hurling ends. So forgiven people are forgiving people. Forgiven people, that eliminates hiding. And forgiving people, that eliminates hurling. Oh, and we need to understand what true repentance is, by the way. So this is what it would look like in our life. And, and, the, and it tells us, write this down, it's, it's not on your notes, but 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11, it makes a distinction between worldly repentance and godly repentance. So, so worldly repentance is sorrow for the pain my sin has caused me. It's, so, it's called self-pity. So you could cry and, oh, this is horrible. And you're, you're, it's so painful, the, you know, what this sin has caused me, and that's called self-pity, and that's not true repentance. That, that kind of change won't last. Godly repentance is sorrow for the pain my sin has caused, not so much me, but God and others. I always listen for that when people are repenting. I listen for it in my own heart, first and foremost. But when I listen to it, I go, hmm, that sounds like self-pity. Not to be confused, because that's not going to transform a person's life. You see, sin is not just breaking God's rules. But it's breaking God's heart and trampling on his love and wisdom. You broke the heart of God. I mean, when you have that kind of intimacy with God, that's you don't want to break his heart. No one loves you like him. You have that intimacy with him. You're going to go, oh, God, I dishonored you. I was not loyal to you. I gave my heart to other lovers. When you've done so much for me, please, please forgive me. That's true repentance, and you see the damage it's done to others. So cause, unbelief, pride, idolatry, cope, we hide and we hurl. Here's the curse that we live under. Let's see if we can knock this out. There's spiritual death. Look at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the word walking here is, is Hebrew idiom, to walk with God or someone meant to have fellowship, friendship, to be close to to do life with. Uh, so there, the Bible would say, and I said spiritual death. This is spiritual death. Now, 
There are those that would define spiritual death in our culture today wrongly. They would say dead as a doorknob. You're dead as a corpse spiritually. That's not true. The death that we're talking about here is that you are alienated, separated from God. They are alienated, separated from God. They're spiritually dead in, in that sense. And so they haven't entered into a realm of inability to respond to God because God's going to come after them and begin to draw them in. And so through the presentation of the gospel, you can respond to the gospel. You're not dead where you can't respond anymore. Everybody on the planet is, is, is in this place of being dead spiritually, alienated from God, but if they hear the gospel, they have the ability to be able to respond to the gospel. And I base that on Luke chapter 15, verses 24 and 32. Remember the prodigal son's story that I talked about earlier? The one son that went away from his father, took the inheritance and spent it on wild, crazy living. And when he comes back, the father says twice, my son was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. Well, he wasn't dead. He was alienated and separated from God or from his father. So we are alienated, separated from God because of our rebellion against him. And here's what you need to keep in mind. All human problems are ultimately symptoms and our separation from God is the cause. I talked about it last weekend. Sin, living outside of God's word and design, unleashes the forces of chaos and darkness. It violates the very fabric of God's design and unravels God's creation. So it goes from spiritual death. So I'm alienated and separated from God, the the source of life and love and liberty, unlike I've ever known before. I become empty and it creates a psychological death. That's the next one. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. Philippians 2.3 helps us to understand that. It says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So it says rivalry, which is literally selfish ambition or self-promotion or conceit. Uh, The King James uses the word vain glory or empty of glory. So think about this. We turn away from God. We become empty of this glory that only he can give us, this honor. And then so immediately, as I said, we become self-centered and we become self-promoters to try to fill up the emptiness inside and it wrecks havoc in our life. When otherwise, we should be the most contented people in the world. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But instead, we've got all sorts of idolatry and covetousness taking hold of our lives. And think about that. If I have peace with God, I should have the peace of God ruling my heart and mind psychologically. And then that would relegate and translate into the peace from God keeping me from social death and how I inter relate with others. So you can almost see this chain reaction happening. That's your next fill in the blank, by the way, social death. So you got spiritual death, which creates psychological death, which I'm, I'm, I'm not complete like I should. See, I was meant to walk in the garden in the cool of the day, to look into the face of our, my maker and receive all of the satisfaction, security, and significance I'd ever need in him. So I'd have this fullness, and then I go out into life socially and I become a giver rather than a taker. But because I'm empty, I become more of a taker. Verses 11 through 3, Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Look at verse, it's, we didn't read it, but it's, in, it, it's verse 16. Your desire shall be for or against your husband. He shall rule over you. It's just conflict. Galatians 5.26 It says this, let us not become conceited, in other words, empty of glory. What happens when we do that? Provoking one another, that's an attitude of superiority or boasting, and envying one another, that's an attitude of inferiority or self-pity. So we trample on the image of God in others in direct proportion to how it is broken in us. That's why I shared last weekend, John 13. I mean, the disciples, on the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, he's washing their feet. They're arguing over who's the greatest. They're trampling on the image of God in each other. They're competing. These guys are crazy. They're like us. 
The disciples were arguing over who was the greatest, provoking and envying one another because they didn't realize the greatness they already had in Christ. So if you pursue relationships, career, family, parenting, sports, before achieving a healthy sense of identity in Christ, then your relationships, your career, your family, your parenting, your sports will become an effort to complete yourself. Listen, and you will crush any of those things, all of those things under the weight of your unrealistic expectations because you're trying to get from any of those things or all of those things what you only should be getting from God. It creates problems socially and it all goes back to God. So think about that. If I have peace with God, I'm going to have the peace of God. And then I'm going to have peace from God horizontally in my life. I'm going to be a peacemaker. And then, of course, this causes physical death. That's your last one right there. With pain, you will give birth to children, verse 16, verse 18. It, the ground, will produce thorns and thistles. Turning our back on God has put us at odds with creation. Disease, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, famine, colds, flu, flood, floods, uh, food poisoning, eventually physical death. So cause unbelief, pride, idolatry, hiding, hurling is the way we try to cope. The curse, spiritual, psychological, social, physical death. Oh my goodness, I love this chapter because it gives us the cure. <laughs> This is at the beginning of the book. We've already messed up. And here's the cure. It's right here. It's beautiful. God's mercy, justice, and grace. God's mercy, justice, and grace. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, mercy, not getting what you deserve. Did you notice that he comes to them with questions? Verse 9, where are you? Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Verse 13, what is this that you have done? Uh, An omniscient God doesn't ask questions for information, okay? You guys know that, don't you? He's not asking questions for information, but to bring revelation to the one being asked. This is a beautiful revelation of our merciful God. He doesn't descend in fire and judgment upon them. Moments into the fall of the human race, and he's already our wonderful counselor. I love it. I love it. See, I'm, I'm a preacher, okay? So you come to me for counseling, I'm going to preach at you, okay? I'm going to tell you what for. What you, gee, why'd you eat that? What were you thinking? Come on. Not God. He says, what's happening in your heart? Where are you? He's asking questions. He's peeling back the layers. That's a really great way to counsel. Not the way I would typically do it, okay. And I'm getting better. My wife says, oh, you're getting a lot better. You're starting to ask more questions. That's actually just a really good way when you inter- interact with people. Is he's, he's pulling back the layers. And here's what you need to keep in mind. It's not repentance that brings the Father's love, but it's the Father's love that brings the repentance. And then there's the justice, Jesus getting what you deserve. This is powerful. If you've got your Bibles open, underline verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. She shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is called the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. Here's the picture. Imagine a family hiking Thunderbird Park and a poisonous snake very quickly slithers out in the middle of them, but the father goes after the snake to stomp on it and crush its head. He destroys the snake, saves the family, but in the process, the snake bites him and he dies. That's the picture. Sound familiar? Sacrificial love. A human being, the offspring of the woman, is going to destroy Satan's sin and death and get a fatal wound in the process. Yes, that's our Savior. It's talking about our Savior. Romans 3, 25 and 26, the cross is the place where our judgment, our judge takes our judgment. Grace, here it is. You getting what Jesus deserves. Verse 21, You might not have read this before, but it's in verse 21 of Genesis 3. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God covers our sins through the shedding of blood. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So what does he do? He gives us his righteousness. He covers us and he covers our sin. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.10, if while we were sinners, 
We were reconciled to God by his death, the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Here's the final statement right here. This is the gospel right here. Don't forget this. This is important. And we're going to pray. In justice, God passed the required sentence of death on our sin, but in mercy, he took that punishment himself and in grace has forgiven us and adopted us into his family, lavishing us with his love forever. So, next uh, weekend, Christmas Eve, services 10, 4, and 6. Might want to come to the 6 o'clock service. The 2 and 4 will pack out fast, so get here early. And... uh, if you're going to come to one of those two services, but you want the less crowded is the six, six o'clock service, invite your family and friends, greatest story, story ever told. We're going to talk about redemption, a solution, um, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders or leaders. If uh, you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer those questions for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just take a moment. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message of redemption, of hope. Lord, we live in a broken world filled with sin and suffering. None of us are exempt, and uh, the cause is unbelief, pride, idolatry. We tend to mismanage it through hiding and hurling. Lord, we, we want to get better at receiving your forgiveness for the sins we've committed and then giving your forgiveness for the sins that have been committed against us. Help us to do that so that we can begin to minimize and stop the spread of this this spiritual, psychological, social, and physical death. We know that we can only do that with your grace and mercy because Jesus took our justice for us, our judgment on the cross for us. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your healing power in our lives. Thank you for bringing Jesus into our lives as the cure for our sin and suffering problem. We love him. We praise him. We give glory to him this morning in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Love you guys. God bless you.